Hello. Um, I'm Shelly. I'm uh, from the... Okay? Yeah. Uh, all right. Hi. Uh, 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 welcome to the to the Kiskit textbook discussions where we uh, uh, read uh, chapters from the Kiskit textbook uh, and we are joined by experts and um, uh, authors from the field uh, to help us learn more about the topics, answer our questions, just engage in a very casual discussion. Uh, today we will be talking more about randomized, randomized benchmarking and joining us today is uh, Dr. Shali Garion. Uh, she is a researcher at IBM uh, HEFA uh, Research Labs and um, she is also uh, a co-author on this chapter as well as uh, on the Kiskit Ignis package. Um, so without further ado, let's uh, start the session. Uh, hi, Dr. Garin, how are you doing? Hi, um, thank you very much. Thanks for uh, inviting me. I'm very happy to talk about the randomized benchmarking um, and their implementation in IGNIS. So actually this implementation is the work of many, many people across, really across labs around the world. We have contributors from Haifa and from Yorktown, of course, and from Tokyo. Um, so many people um, contributed to this uh, code. Um, yeah, so I... Right, yeah, uh, okay. please, please yeah. Uh, go ahead okay. with your uh, presentation. And uh, to the people who are watching right now, please feel free to ask your questions uh, and just engage in the conversation on the chat over here. Uh, Dr. Garion, uh, take it away. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so um, here is a brief sketch of what I'll talk about. So I first describe uh, the randomized benchmarking algorithm. Um, then I will discuss the Clifford group, which is one of the main ingredients of this algorithm, and discuss a little bit the code architecture that we have currently in IGNIS. Um, and then I'll talk about um, more advanced randomized benchmarking methods and generalizations um, from various uh, types. So we have generalizations in order to estimate certain kinds of noise and other methods that have certain types of groups, not necessarily Cliffords. Um, and then at the end, they will discuss the theoretical background um, behind the randomized benchmarking and the Clifford group. Okay, um, so what is randomized benchmarking? So randomized benchmarking is a proven protocol that provides efficient and reliable estimation of an average error rate for the set of quantum gates operations. So why do we need randomized benchmarking? So basically the basic algorithm, well-known algorithm for like decades to, to do such a to, to somehow estimate um, quantum gates and quantum operators is tomography. Uh, but tomography is not so good for two reasons. The first one is that it's exponential in the number of qubits. So you can't, you can't, uh, 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 um, you can't uh, estimate uh, the errors when you have many, many qubits. And the second reason is that uh, due to the so-called spam errors. So spam is like state preparation and measurement errors. Um, so you don't want to have them in your estimation. You just want to have what, you just want to understand what are the, the gate errors. Okay, so how do we do uh, randomized benchmarking? So basically our algorithm contains of the following three steps. First, um, we generate the so-called randomized benchmarking sequences. How do we generate them? We um, take, uh, we fix, um, we fix a, a, a length m. This is like you can see in the graph. This is the x-axis of the graph. So we fix various lengths, and then we generate random elements, not from uh, random unitary gates, but from a certain group called the Clifford group. I will discuss it more in the next slide. Um, okay, so we have uh, random elements from the Clifford group, um, and we have like 10 elements, 20 elements, 100 elements, 200 elements, and so on. And at the end, we compute the uh, reverse gate, the inverse gate of all the Cliffords that we have so far. Um, Okay, so if we didn't have any errors and everything was totally perfect, um, then when we execute this circuit, since, since we have all the gates and then at the end the reverse gate, 
if we start with some uh, state, like um, the ground state, we should get back the same state that we started with. So um, you can see here at the beginning of the graph, the, the y-axis is the ground state population. So when we start and we don't do anything, basically um, the probability to get back to the ground state is 100% uh, is one. Um, yes, so this is in case we didn't have any errors. But at the real world, we do have errors because our quantum computers are not perfect. Um, so when we run these RB sequences, and we can execute and run them either on a real quantum hardware or on a simulator with some noise model. This example is on a simulator. And we compare to the ground state. You can see that when the sequence gets longer and longer and longer, then the probability um, goes down exponentially. Um, as you can see in this example, this is two qubit randomized benchmarking. Um, OK, so this means that if we do, uh, if the sequence is, is long enough, then basically getting back to the ground state would be just random. So a random on two qubits, then we have like four, uh, we have, I mean, we have like four choices, so zero, 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 one, one zero and one one, so the probability you see gets to tw gets asymptotically to twenty five percent, zero point twenty five. This is what you can see here in this graph. Um, okay, so what we try uh, to do here is to get these statistics. I mean, we have um, we do several experiments from several kinds of length, and then we pl plot a curve as you can see in the graph. Um, and then we fit this graph to an exponential decaying curve. Um, you can see as a parameter of the Clifford length, m is the Clifford length. Um, yes, and we get a parameter p. And this is so-called the depolarizing parameter, and we'll discuss it later when we discuss the theory of randomized benchmarking. From this depolarizing parameter, we calculate an error, which we call the error per Clifford. And we denote it by, by r. And this is the formula. And um, generally, what's interesting is that um, in the decaying curve, P, and so as error per Clifford R, does not depend on the spam errors. It does not depend on the state preparation and measurement errors. They are just observed in the constants A and B. Um, yes, so, so are there any questions on, on this slide so far, or should I move to the Clifford group? Uh, I, I think it, it's all right if you um, maybe complete the slides first because uh, uh, I think I can take all the questions at the end. Um, so, yeah, okay. that's quite all right. Okay, okay, because this is this is very important slide because here we actually explain this algorithm. So, right. um, so it's, it's, it's important to, to understand at least what this algorithm is doing. Although, I mean, maybe not the theory, but at least how this algorithm works. Absolutely. Uh, so we have okay. pe people who are watching. Uh, please make sure that you get the slide. You understand it perfectly. And if, there, if you have any questions, uh, please let us know uh, in the in the chat right now. Um, yeah, Doctor, please go ahead. Right. Okay. So I'll move to the Clifford group. So what is the Clifford group? So actually, the Clifford group is is rather amazing because it consists of quantum operators that can be efficiently simulated in polynomial time using a classical computer, not a quantum, a classical computer. This is called Clifford simulation. And the theorem is a well-known theorem of Gottesman and Neil, um, actually, that you can simulate it um, in, in using a classical computer. And so like an n-qubit Clifford operator, um, I mean, if a unitary quantum operator usually need like two to the n, uh, state vector to hold it with the Clifford operator, you just need a, a matrix of 2 to the n by 2 to the n, uh, 2n, sorry, not 2 to the n, 2n by 2n, and another, um, yeah. So, so it's really quite very, very efficient. And um, the amazing thing is, oh, sorry, that it's generated by three gates. Um, all the Clifford gates can be generated by only three gates. So we have the Hadamard, the phase gate S, and the controlled knot uh, or the controlled X uh, gate. 
Um, and as you can see, one important gate is missing here. And the missing gate is a T gate. Because if we had the T gate, which is basically just like a root of S, namely T squared equals S, then we will have a universal set of gates, and then we will have a universal quantum computer. So the only difference between classical and quantum is just the difference between this S and T. And it's really amazing, actually, that you can have this uh, gottesman nil theorem. Um, yes, so the Clifford group on one qubit has just like 24 elements. It's really nice. But the size of this group grows uh, exponentially with the number of qubits. And you can see the formula. So it's not so easy to, to work with the Clifford group, actually, although it's, it's, it's finite and, um, yeah, and can be, um, can be um, implemented in a, on a classical computer. And um, we have efficient, I mean, we have a known efficient algorithms originally by Gottesman and Neil, and then by uh, Aronson Gottesman, and then by also by Maslow and Bravi and so on, to generate uh, elements and, um, and perform operations in the Clifford group, and also to, syn to synthesize Clifford elements. What do I mean by synthesize? Synthesize means that when we have a Clifford element in this compact, uh, presentation um, as a Clifford operator, then we can calculate back which uh, the basic slide is the basic gates um, that, that implements it. Again, Hadamard's, s naught, s gates, phase gates, and c naught. Yes, and th this is very important for the randomized benchmarking algorithm because at least at the end, when you calculate the inverse gate, you need to translate it back to gates in order to actually run these sequences on the device or on the simulator. Okay. Um, yes, so this is a Clifford group. Okay. Um, so how does this code looks like in QuizKit? Um, okay. So basically the randomized benchmarking code is in Ignis and, and this is this code is written in Python. And then we have a brand new um, Clifford operator class, I think just came out in the last release. Um, I'm not sure if you heard uh, Chris Wood's talk in the circuits uh, seminar, like I think like last week or a couple of weeks ago, but if not, then please listen to him. You have this on YouTube and he explains the operator class in general and the Clifford class in particular. So this is a brand new class now in, in Terra. Before that, we had a small Clifford class just in Ignis, just for randomized benchmarking, but now we have to refactor the code to work with the Clifford class in Terra. And there is also a Clifford simulator, which is much more efficient because it's written in C++, and this is in, in Air. Um, yes, so we have um, many ingredients. And I think in his talk, uh, Chris explained, I mean, what are the differences between L simulator in C++ and the uh, class in Terra? And yes, what are the differences and how, how it's more efficient with the C++? Yes, but for randomized benchmarking, we can work with the Python class in Terra because we don't have so many, so many qubits now. Um, yeah, okay. So this is, this is the uh, overview of the code. Um, yes, so basically when we are looking at, at IGNIS framework, so why, what is IGNIS? So IGNIS, um, we have quantum systems, so they are noisy, and we want somehow to understand and mitigate um, the noise and the errors in quantum circuits. So, um, so we basically, every, um, almost every code like in, in IGNIS, every algorithm that we have in IGNIS have the following like, three ingredients. So first we have circuits. We need to generate certain circuits and they can be RB sequence, randomized benchmarking sequence here, or um, they can be tomography circuits or measurement mitigation circuits or quantum volume circuits and so on. So first you have code for gener generating circuits. Then after you generate the circuits, you um, transpile them and execute them either on a simulator with some noise model that you want to somehow understand or, um, or on the real device, naturally. And then um, after you execute, you get the results and you need to fit them into some curves. 
And usually this curve it has some like exponential decay or, and so on. And when you fit this curve, you get back the parameters. Um, in our case, it is the depolarizing parameter T and the error per clipboard. And in case of measurement mitigation, we have an extra, an extra step for which we also get raw results and mitigated results, but this is um, not relevant for randomized benchmarking. But if you, but, but this is basically the same way that all algorithms in IGNIS look like. Okay. Um, yes. Um, okay. So basically all of them work with uh, circuits. Um, we also have some part that relates to, to open paths. Um, in randomized benchmarking, if you want to work with open paths, I think the idea is that you can like calibrate your gate using open paths. And then when you have this gate calibrated, then you can insert it to a circuit and then run the circuit with RB. So this is a way to combine open paths and uh, the circuit mechanism. Okay. Um, yeah, so actually running randomized benchmarking is really, really, really simple. What I tried to mark here in yellow is actually the code lines that actually does the RB and not the other stuff. So you need to import the randomized benchmarking and um, and the fitters and um, the function, as I said, there are two functions, randomized benchmarking sequence, generating the sequence and the RB fitter. And then you need to define your parameters. So length vector is just like the, how many Cliffords you want to generate. Um, so you just have some vector, as you see, one, 10, 20, 100, 200, and so on. This is the X axis of, the, of your graph. Now, and seeds mean how many sequences uh, would you like to have per each length? So in this case, you will have like five uh, points. Okay, F five points for each, uh, from each length. And then um, another parameter is the RB pattern. So in this case, uh, we have like two qubit RB on qubits zero and one. And generally you should, you should uh, define the pattern, I mean, which, um, which qubits do you run the RB? And you can also run RB simultaneously on several qubits. For example, you can run two qubit RB on qubit zero and one, and one qubit RB on qubit three, and so on. Um, okay, so you, so you have now these parameters that you define, and you call the function randomized benchmarking sequence, and you get back um, RB cert, and um, and X data, which is just the input data that you have. Here we run it on a noisy simulator. So we um, we call a uh, simulator and we define some noise model. We put some depolarizing error on the one qubit gates and another depolarizing error on the two qubit gates. Um, usually, um, yeah, the, the two qubit gates are like 10 times more uh, noisy than the one qubit gates. This is like in the real hardware, you can see that when you run on the real hardware, you can ask for the parameters and, and it will tell, and it tells you how much noise you have. Oh, sorry. And um, yes, um, in this example, we start by creating the RB fitter first without the circuits and then running, um, running, uh, executing um, the sequences um, um, per each seed. I mean, we, we start executing them for each seed and fit them and add, add them to the fitter after each uh, experiment um, and calculate the upper Clifford after each, uh, after each new result is added. Yes, uh, this is uh, how the experimentalists work. They want to see somehow how the curve behave and how the fitters behave when you add more seeds, more, more sequences. So here we have like five sequences. So we run it like five times. Okay. So this is basically the code and um, you see it in the tutorial or in the Kiski textbook. Um, yeah, I mean, you, you can try it and it works. Yes. Um, okay. Um, yes. So um, from now on, I would like, I mean, at the, at the end, I will talk about a bit more about the theory behind our randomized benchmarking, but now I would like to talk about some generalizations that we, some of them we already implemented in Qiskit and some of them 
are still work in progress. So if there are any questions and TILFA or something is not understood, then maybe it's better to, to see now. Um, and if everything is okay, then I can continue. Uh, all right, so we do have one question over here. Uh, uh, it's from uh, Harris X. I hope I pronounced that name correctly. Uh, so he asks, what would give rise to a sy systematic offset B? I'm not, I'm not really sure uh, what that means there, but if, if you what? understand it. What question? Uh, the question is, what would give rise to a systematic offset B? Systematic offset B? Um, I'm not sure that I understood the question. That, that's, that's all right. Um, uh, if, if you could, Harris uh, if you could uh, rephrase your question once again, that'll be uh, that'll be nice of you. Um, in the meanwhile, I don't think we have any more questions, so it's it's safe for you to, okay. to move on. Thank you. Okay, okay. So um, so randomized benchmarking, um, and we get when we get like the error per Clifford, it just give us like one number. Um, okay, this is the error per Clifford. So we have, so we know that we have some error. Um, so what, 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 what is it, what is it good for, actually? Um, so uh, one thing we can do with it is try, and, and I'll talk a bit at the end about it, is try to like, um, from the error per Clifford, try to estimate like specific uh, gate error and so on. But um, other possible generalizations of RB is to somehow understand not only um, that we have some error, but what kinds of errors do we have um, in, uh, in this, using uh, vari vari various variants of these randomized benchmarking methods. So uh, one variant, I mean, the first one is interleaved randomized benchmarking. Um, for which we try to estimate um, the average error of some individual specific quantum gates, and I will talk about the algorithm soon because we have it already implemented in IGNIS. Another thing is purity randomized benchmarking, which can say whether our algorithm is, our, whether our, um, our, our errors, sorry, are coherent or non-coherent. Um, and again, we have implementation in Ignis, so I'll talk a bit later about it. Um, then we also have leakage randomized benchmarking that quantifies and characterizes leakage errors. So what are leakage errors? Leakage errors are unwanted energy levels. So usually, you know, we have the energy levels after we measure, we have zero and one. But I mean, in the physics world, we have more than zero and one, we usually have like two, three and so on. So leakage means that somehow we, we moved from zero one to, to another energy levels that we don't want. And there is, so, so it's a work in progress to, to do it. There is a theoretical paper by Chris Wood, but it's not yet implemented. Um, then there is uh, the theory of simultaneous randomized benchmarking. So you can run randomized benchmarking on n qubit Clifford, basically like on the entire hardware maybe and get like error per Clifford for the entire circuit. Then you will have like one number that evaluates this uh, circuit. This is like, I don't know, like cross entropy randomized benchmarking in a sense. This is um, cross entropy benchmarking. This is algorithm that's used for the quantum supremacy algorithm um, and so on. Um, but you can also try to divide um, to divide your uh, qubits into uh, smaller, um, yeah, to, to smaller, um, yeah, smaller sets of qubits of only like one qubit, two qubit, three qubit, um, um, three qubit uh, subsystems, and then run randomized benchmarking simultaneously on all these uh, subsystems. So, as I said in the code, at least by the RB pattern, you can choose and you can divide your uh, qubits into subsystems and run our randomized benchmarking simultaneously on these subs subsystems. And then there is a recent paper of Dave McKay and others about correlated RB, that when you divide actually um, these, uh, so you divide, it, you, you divide um, your qubits into subsystems or to different qubits, I mean, how you can estimate a crosstalk between these qubits and, um, and between different subsystems. 
So, um, yeah, so this is actually a work in progress when it's still need to, to implement and, and have it in Ignis, but I, it's, it's in the plan. I hope we'll do it this year. Um, yes. Um, okay. So, um, what we currently have in Ignis, um, be, besides this uh, standard, the so-called standard randomized benchmarking that I described at the beginning, it's the first step, is first interleaved randomized benchmarking. So you have um, a given Clifford gate uh, C, and you want to estimate the average error rate of this Clifford gate. And this can be like, like a gate even that you want to implement yourself using open paths, for example, as long as it's Clifford um, in this case. Um, so the idea is that you implement the standard randomized benchmarking sequence. As you see, this is the, the sequence at the, at the top of the, of the slide. And you execute it and run and calculate the parameter, depolarized parameter P, um, just as you did before. This is just standard randomized benchmarking. Then um, you create another uh, randomized benchmarking sequence by taking the original sequence and just put your gate C between every two elements. And of course, when you calculate the reverse element, then, um, yeah, then you, need, you need to recalculate it again. And here you have, uh, now your, your uh, sequence will be actually two times longer. But still we, we have it, um, yeah, I mean, um, yeah, we, we assume like the length, we, we assume that length M is like the length of the original sequence. And again, we run it, we execute it, and then we get another depolarized parameter. Uh, we call it like P of C. And the error, the gate error of the Clifford of the interleaved gate C is estimated using this formula. As you can see here, this is the error rate of C. Um, yes. Um, yes. So basically you can see that if like the original, um, original standard RB was perfect and there were no errors in the original gates, then P um, would be one, and then uh, the RCS would be just, um, basically just the, the, the error per Clifford, uh, the estimated error per Clifford, would be just, um, yeah, just, just the error of the gate, uh, the gate C. And this, if all other gates were totally, totally perfect. And, um, okay, so basically, um, we always have like statistical errors because we run uh, we run uh, the sequences several times. But in this case, we also have some systematic errors, and we need to consider it because when you run on on real hardware, then actually sometimes you must understand that you have this systematic error. So um, so sometimes it can happen like that uh, the systematic error E is much larger, I mean, like in the orders of magnitude, than your uh, gate error estimation. And this means that basically maybe your gate error estimation is, is meaningless because you cannot estimate it accurately. Um, yeah, so, so this is something to consider, that you have to make sure, and the systematic errors come because the, um, because of the, the gates in the... No, the non-interleaved gates, the original gates that we started with, are not perfect, and they have their own errors. So we need to be careful here and take this uh, and take these numbers into consideration, um, especially the systematic errors bound. Yes. Um, okay. Uh, yes. So, yeah. So, so basically, this code is actually implemented, and we can look at the documentation of randomized benchmarking to understand to see how to, to run this uh, interleaved randomized benchmarking. Yes, we actually had a tutorial about it, but now they did some, some work on the tutorials and, and, and removed them. So I hope that they will come back sometime, and maybe as part of the documentation. Okay. Um, okay, so this is interleaved randomized benchmarking. Now for a purity randomized benchmarking, this is also an algorithm that is implemented in IGNIS. Um, and again, you can look at the documentation to understand how to implement it. And here we want to understand whether the errors that we have are coherent or not. So um, coherent means that the state is pure, um, or coherent, I mean. Um, yes, yeah, that, that we only have like coherent errors. 
And this is if and only if the trace of cross square equals one. This is a nice exercise actually to understand that we have in you are we are in a pure state if and only if trace cross square equals one. Um, yes, yeah, so here you, for example, you can see two graphs um, um, that we did. So um, the top one, so you see the x, the x axis is as before, but the y axis is not probability anymore, it's a trace of rho square. So um, what happens is, if, is that um, if we have a noise that is not coherent, like depolarized noise or thermal noise or anything, then we have, um, an, um, we have an asymptotic decay, as we did in the original randomized benchmarking algorithm. And um, yeah, we have the same parameter as before, and we'll see it um, in a minute. And this is the top graph. And the graph at the bottom is what happens when we have coherent noise. When we have only coherent noise, then trace rho square should be equal to 1. And you can see, I mean, it's a bit... Uh, it, we, you, have, you see a small fluctuation, I mean, it could be a little bit um, uh, above one because of some calculation errors, or it could be a bit below one, but generally it's, it's around one. And yeah, you saw, so you see the graph, it, the method works actually. Uh, yes, so how do we calculate purity randomized benchmarking? So actually, because we, we need to calculate the trace of cross square, we do a process that is very similar to tomography. So this algorithm is not very efficient, but it's good um, for our hardware team because um, yeah, they, they want to somehow, when they want to, to make sure, when they calibrate the quantum gates and they want to make sure that they don't have coherent errors. Um, yes, so again, you generate randomized benchmarking sequences and then you need to calculate the purity, which is traits of your rho square. So for each RB sequence, we actually perform three to the n experiments. For each qubit, we, be, we do either nothing or we do a rotation by the x-axis or rotation by the y-axis over the y-axis by pi over 2. And um, then for each uh, such experiment, we, have we obtain 2 to the n expectation values. And then from the Pauli expectation values, we can calculate trace of cross square. And actually, we have some redundancy here because in order to calculate trace of cross square, we need 4 to the n Pauli expectation values. But here, but here we have 3 to the n experiments and 2 to the n expectation values, so we have 6 to the n actually uh, different values. So we have a bit of redundancy here. And we fit trace of cross square to... Um, again, to the exponential decaying curve. Now the exponent is 2 to, to, to m and not m. And we calculate the error per Clifford and, and yes. Um, yeah, but actually I don't think we must, come, yeah, I mean, we can calculate it, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I see we calculate it um, again. Um, yeah, so you see that it only, it's only meaningful when, when the, the errors are non-coherent. Yes, yeah, so, so this is again a, a method that we have already implemented in Qiskit. Um, yes, and as I told, as I said before, there are also methods that we would like to implement in the future, like leakage RB and correlated RB and so on. Um, yes. Okay, um, another uh, interesting method. Okay, so randomized benchmarking works well for Clifford gates, but what do we do? with non-Clifford gates. Is there some way we can, we can handle them? Uh, yes, so there was a method this described um, some time ago called the hydral RB. Mainly, we want to benchmark over the one qubit the hydral group. And this group also includes a T gate. But it does not include all quantum gates because then it will be universal and then it will be too difficult. So we look only at the T gate, or generally any root, root of unity, so we call it, we can denote it by Zn, so Z2 is just the usual Z gate, Z4 is the S gate, and Z8 is the T gate, and the X gate. So here you have a dehydral group, the dehydral group means just mathematically the dehydral group, so it's the X gate is the gate that does a reflection, and the T gate does rotation. So uh, if you have only X and T gate, you just have like the dehydral group on uh, D, D8. Okay, um, yes. 
And now we also implemented, um, so you want to generalize this data group to more qubits. So um, there is a paper generating to, to, do, to do benchmarking over the so-called CNOT dihedral group. So this is the same dihedral group as before, X gate and T gate, so you have a reflection and rotation, but also you can add all uh, CNOT gates. So we already have this algorithm of benchmarking the CNOT dihedral group as part of the randomized benchmarking code. I mean, it's very, very easy to, to try to work on the scene of the hydral group. Just one of the parameters that you need to, to put in the beginning, instead of, um, you just call, I think the parameter is called group gates, and you just call, like, you, you, you put their scene of the hydral, and then it works with the scene of the hydral group. Uh, again, everything is explained in the documentation. Um, why do we want to do, um, Synodehedral benchmarking. So the reason is that this allows us to benchmark some non-Clifford gates, and this is a work in progress that we now do. We try to benchmark uh, like control desk gate and so on. Um, yes, and also theoretically it's it's nice because um, like the Clifford group, also the Synodehedral group comes from error correction codes um, and has all sorts of uh, of applications also to to quantum error correction. Um, and working with it both for randomized benchmarking, randomized benchmarking or for other implementations, we try to understand the structure be be better and, and they have some paper um, with Andrew Cross. We still, we will still uh, need to publish it, but uh, we have some, some work in progress um, to explain how to, to work uh, with, with this group and provide some forms and so on. So it's very interesting. Um, yes. Um, another work that I did with uh, some students um, was to, to go from Clifford group, which is very complicated because its size grows uh, exponentially and so on, to simpler uh, subgroups of the Clifford group, like Pauli group or other groups like the Synod Pauli groups. Um, and, and it's very interesting because um, although um, they are not like, um, I think it's called like unitary, I mean, they're not sample the unitary group well as the Clifford group, but still there, I mean, at least in the papers, they say that you can work in it for benchmarking. So, so it's, and, and they're much easy to, easier to implement. Yes. So, um, yeah, so, yeah, so, so this is one thing. Yes. Um, yes. So I talked m much about the Clifford group. But actually, I mean, we don't really have like a so-called Clifford element. Every Clifford element, we basically need to translate back to one qubit and two qubit gates. Usually the two qubit gates are the synod gates, and one qubit gates could be Hadamard and phase gates or other one qubit gates like U1, U2, U3. So when you have like n qubit randomized benchmarking, then the Cliffords become more and more and more heavy and complicated. And then the error per Clifford is actually, actually comes from, from many, 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 many errors, both one qubit and two qubit gates, and, and it's difficult. So there is some paper um, called Direct Randomized Benchmarking that suggests that actually one can benchmark only um, the native gate sets. Um, and not like native get sets means like depth the depth one digits. And again, they can statistically explain why why it's still good enough. And this is interesting, and we, we are working on it and trying to somehow understand whether whether indeed this will be this may be more helpful maybe than the standard randomized benchmarking. Yes. Um, yes. Um, yes, yeah, so so this is all sorts of possible generalizations. And I think like there are about probably dozens of papers of various generalizations of randomized benchmarking and various methods. Um, I think if you just put like in the archive or something, you will find out many, many papers on random, randomized benchmarking and many methods. Um, yes, um, yes. So if you have any question about this generalization, then I'd be happy to hear. And if not, I'll discuss a little bit the theory of randomized benchmarking. Uh, okay, so are you taking up questions right now? 
What? Uh, will you take uh, questions yeah, yeah. right now or will you take questions sure. later? Um, you can ask questions if you have some questions, specific questions right. on the uh, visualization. Uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, so uh, not on the generalization, but uh, the previous question that I was asking, so I have a little more elaboration on that. So mm -hmm. the question is on the first slide of, of like the very first slide of the presentation, you uh, explain randomized benchmarking. Uh, you fit a curve with exponent R and an offset B. Uh, random errors yes. of the gates give rise to exponential decay. But where do you get a B offset from? Uh, the the person who has the question wants to understand why uh, the errors don't make the fidelity drop all the way down to zero. Does, does uh, that explain the question? Uh, we have the constant B. Yeah. Um, okay. I. Yeah, I think I think that um, usually the constant A and B absorb and I'm maybe absorb the um, state preparation and the measurement errors. Yes. So they, they are absorbed in this constant. Okay, so, so um, this is part of uh, yeah, okay, they, they absorbing the... Okay, okay, okay. okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. And, and I too had a question earlier uh, regarding like the absorption of the, of the errors, uh, such as the edge effect, which also gets absorbed uh, in the average sequence fidelity during the fitting of the results. So I believe this, uh, like during the fitting, all of these errors get absorbed and, and that, that's a reason that uh, the fidelity doesn't drop all the way down to zero, like it stays uh, like it gets exponentially and then becomes constant uh, over a certain period of yeah. time all right got it yes i, I hope yes. uh, yeah so uh, do you have something to add uh, no i think uh, what i wanted to say is this is a good 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 great question because it gets us to the theoretical background of right. randomized benchmarking and this is the next slide i wanted to to discuss um yes so um Okay, so basically we start from um, from the ground state a row, and then we start executing um, the Clifford sequence C zero, C one, C two, C three, so on to the CM. Um, yes, so we can somehow at least uh, theoretically think that we have like um, ideal Clifford, so we have like ideal Clifford gates, and we have a noise, and we somehow assumes that the noise is like um, spread evenly over all the Cliffords. So we have this noise uh, lambda. And now we have like a mathematical trick that between any, between uh, lambda and, um, and CI, we put, uh, we put an inverse Clifford multiplied by, by, Clif by, by uh, the same Clifford. So mathematically it works. But this actually means that when we look at the expected value of probabilities, then we can somehow separate it to uh, different M channels. So we have um, lambda, the noise lambda, and then um, it's um, uh, conjugated by the Clifford. So we have CI and CI dagger, and we have this like M, M times. And because we say, okay, the noise is independent on the Clifford we chose, and this is like the assumption, the theoretical assumption that we have here, we have a factorization into a product of uh, average quantum channels. And each term of this product is actually a group average. And uh, the, notion, the, the notion in physics, it's called twirl. Twirl is just mathematically, it means averaging over group and physicists like to use it like they say we are now twirl the quantum channel uh, yes so um, basically twirl is like taking the average and here since the Clifford group is a finite group then averaging is just um, averaging um, when we take an average over all Cliffords in the group this is a finite group and this is the same actually as averaging over all the unitary group using the Haar measure. Um, yeah, this is a mathematical uh, theorem. Um, and this is because the Clifford group is a so-called unitary to design. There is some definition of unitary to design, but the important thing to remember is exactly this equality, that averaging over the Clifford group is the same as averaging over all the unitary group with some Haar measure. This means that 
theoretically, when we sample from the Clifford group, when we take elements from the Clifford group, then we have good uh, representatives to all the unitary group, which is an infinite group, of course. So this is why the Clifford group is so important. Uh, by the way, before that, I discussed the dihedral group, the synodihedral group, the Pauli group, and so on. All these groups are not unitary to designs, and they are not sampling uh, the unitary group as well, but still the, you can do some variants of randomized benchmarking to work with them. Uh, yes, and I think that it's still a mathematical, physical open question whether you have good unitary to design which are not the Clifford group. Um, yes, I, I think it's unknown, um, actually. Okay, so um, I remember, so let's recall that now by independence, we have a product of uh, average channels. So a depolarizing channel, so what is a depolarizing channel? So a depolarizing channel means that we have some parameter P, this is the depolarizing parameter. So with probability P, nothing happens. I mean, we, we are left at the same state that we started with. And with probability one minus, one minus P, we get to the totally mixed uh, state. So this is definition of um, the polarizing channel. And um, by Schur's lemma and by the, um, and as I said, the average data looks like a product of the polarizing channel. This is what we get. So you see that we get um, P to the M rho um, plus one minus P to the M the, divided by V. So um, this is, um, the formula that we get. And as you can see here, after fitting the results, we get these uh, constants A and B. They come, okay, they come from D. D is uh, two to the, I didn't, ah, D is not written here. Okay, D uh, was defined in the first slide. D is two times N when N is the number of qubits, not two times, two to the power of N. So when N is uh, the number of qubits. Um, okay, so now we have the constant A and B. As, and as I said, also the spam errors, because um, you can see in these sequences that uh, the state preparation and measurement we only have at the beginning and the end to consider. So they are also observed in, in these constants A and B, and they are not, uh, you can ignore them on averaging all the quantum channels. Um, okay, so, so here we get the depolarized parameter P, and you can actually try, try it yourself. I mean, you take the code, you define a depolarized error with a de certain depolarizing parameter, and you see that you get back the same depolarizing parameter. You can see it well if you use uh, interleaved randomized benchmarking uh, with a gate with a certain depolarizing parameter, and all other gates are perfect, for example. Uh, then you really see that it works. I mean, to me it was amazing that you have this very complicated algorithm with a lot of theory in mathematics and physics and so on, and then you run a notebook, you run the code, and it, and it actually works at the end. So it's, it's really amazing. Um, yeah. So uh, the theory works, at least. Uh, yes. So from the um, depolarizing parameter P, we calculate the, the error per Clifford. Um, using this formula. So what is the error per Clifford? So you have, uh, so the error is either you have one minus P, I mean, because you, you missed the state, and then you need to, to subtract the um, mixed uh, error. Okay, so we calculate the error per Clifford. Um, and um, yes, so another, so uh, for basically here you, you completed um, running randomized benchmarking, but another method is from the error per Clifford is try to calculate the actual basic gate fidelity. So as a, to take an example, when you have like two qubit Cliffords, then you have like two qubit gate, usually it's a synop gate, and one qubit gate. Usually we, you can assume that the one qubit errors are negligible, and if not, you can, you can uh, consider them as well. But if they are indeed neg negligible, then most of the, your error comes from the controlled knot or controlled X gate. So basically what you need to count is the average number of uh, C-not errors per uh, Clifford. So the average number, at least for two qubit randomized benchmarking, is uh, 1.5. 
So here you have a nice formula that when you calculate um, two qubits randomized benchmarking, um, um, you can calculate from it the gate error of a controlled X gate. And I think that, uh, yeah, I, I'm not sure, but, but sometimes um, when you publish actually the errors of certain gates, you can derive them in many ways, like in tomography and so on, but also this is a good way to, to derive, and, and we have this code in randomized benchmarking. This is part of the RBUTILS code, and um, I think it's also explained, I, no, I checked, it's also explained in the uh, textbook and also in the Jupyter notebook that we have in the tutorials. Yes. Um, so this is the theoretical part of randomized benchmarking. Um, yes, I, I have another slide, about, a little bit about the theory of Clifford group. So um, the definition of the Clifford group, um, okay, so um, yeah, the Clifford group is just the normalizer of the Pauli group. You can also define it using the stabilizer formalism, but mathematically it's the normalizer of the Pauli group when uh, you ignore the global phase. Um, yes, so um, as you know, the Pauli group, when you ignore the global phase, is just, um, I mean, Basically, it's just isomorphic to like Klein's group to the power of n. So we, so we just have something that looks like a vector space because everything, I mean, x, y, uh, z, and i just um, just look like uh, f two square, just like the like like um, like a vector field over f two. And um, when you um, when you look at the Clifford group modulus, the Pauli group. What you actually get is a, is a group of uh, symplectic matrices. This is a 2n by 2n symplectic matrices over um, the field with two elements. And this group is simple. So a simple group, I don't know if you know the term mathematically, but a simple group means that you cannot refactor it anymore. So actually, when you see a simple group, you know that your life will be difficult because you cannot, you, you cannot reduce it into smaller components. And this is basically uh, the, um, the uh, um, Gottesman-Nil theorem, because instead of the Clifford, what you actually present, the, the, you present the symplectic uh, matrices, the 2n by 2n symplectic matrices, and another vector for the Pauli elements, and this is it. Um, so, so this is basically, as I said, this is the Gottesman-Nil, and uh, there are also Gottesman and everything. So, um, the one qubit Clifford group, um, this is a very nice group. You basically can present each element as a product of uh, A and B. So A is one of the following six elements, as you can see. Uh, I, V, W, Hadamar, H, V, or H, W, when V and W are so-called like the axis uh, swap uh, gates. They are not native gates, but you can easily generate them. And B is one of the Pauli elements. So you have here like 24 elements because you have six options for A and four for B. For the n qubit Clifford group, as I said, it's, it's a problematic group because it grows very, very fast. But still we have gottesman nil theorem and arison gottesman and so on um, to, to work with it in a polynomial time. And we can efficiently select random elements from the Clifford group. So there was a method by Kenning and Smalling doing it by O to, to the N to the 3. But now a recent result by Bravi and Maslow, which is already appears in the code of the Clifford class in Terra, that was just released a few weeks ago, which does it with O N to the, to the N square, O of N square. So, you, so each, if you want to generate random Clifford, so it's just O to the n square. So generating the entire RB sequence, so it depends on the length, so it is some constant, but it's O of n square. So it's really amazing because it means that this algorithm is very, very efficient. And um, yes, so the inefficient part or um, the more problematic part is then when we have the entire sequence and um, we calculate the, the inverse of the sequence, we need to decompose and synthesize it back to some basic gates in order to run it on the hardware or on the simulator. And here, 
there is a basic algorithm of Gottesman and Neil, and then by Aronson Gottesman, and then there are again improvements by Sergey Bravi and so on. And um, we have an optimized algorithm due to uh, Bravi and Maslow for the case of one, two, and three qubits that assures that we have like minimal number of synod gates. But after it, it's, it's more difficult to, to have it optimized. Mm, yes, so, so this is a bit of the theoretical background. Um, yes, yeah, so the, it's really amazing mathematical theory and physical theory um, behind this randomized benchmarking in Clifford group is really amazing, um, I think. Very, very interesting. Um, so I just want to remind you what we discussed. Um, yeah, and now I'm happy to answer, uh, answer your questions. Uh, all right. Uh, thank you, Dr. Garian. Uh, uh, would you would you go on with the summary, or, or are you ready to take uh, questions now? Yeah. No. I mean, this is just um, what what we discussed, just to to remind people. Uh, yes. I understand. What, what, you, can, you can ask questions. Yeah. Got it. Well, also, thank you so much for for that presentation uh, and and for for uh, uh, putting the effort into into uh, explaining each and every detail. I really appreciate it. Uh, all right. So, do we have any more questions? Uh, can can the can the chat add any more questions? Uh, in the meanwhile, I do have a few questions. Uh, if that's all right, um, if anyone has, please. Uh, if, if anyone has any other questions, just add them uh, to the chat panel, and I will ask them later on. Um, yeah. So, one question that I had was uh, on on the on the algorithm complexity, but I guess you answered that uh, uh, with the Bravi paper example. Uh, uh, using Hadamard free circuits for uh, Clifford groups, and I guess that it's, it's really, uh, I think the entire process uh, comes down to a polynomial time process, uh, but it also shows that, that it can be used to simulate um, uh, any any number of, of Clifford groups. Is that mm -hmm. correct? Uh, yes, yes. I mean, you can simulate it. You can simulate um, the Clifford group on n qubits easily. Um, yes, I think the yeah the the last part is um, is decomposing. I mean, you need to decompose. I mean, you need to decompose and synthesize back into circuits. Then basically, it's like Gauss elimination, which is O of n to the cube or something, or a bit. You can maybe make it a bit more efficient sometimes in certain cases. But this is basically it. I mean, the total complexity of generating randomized benchmarking sequences is like O to the n square to generate the random elements, and then the last step of, is O of n cube, and it's really, really efficient. Um, the most time is actually transpiling um, the circuits, and of course, executing them over the hardware or over a simulator. Um, yeah. yeah, okay. This is about, actually, yeah. All right, thank you so much. Um, okay, next question that I had was, um, yeah. So, uh, so you you mentioned in a previous slide that um, twirling over the entire unitary group uh, yields the same result as uh, uh, twirling over uh, uh, to uh, as twirling over the Clifford group result, right? Yeah. Um, and and I, I was hoping to ask, ask if you could just uh, 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 repeat uh, or reiterate that theorem once again. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. So so this is basically the last uh, equality. Um, yeah, so this is the last equality in the bottom of the slide, Got it. actually. So you have this average over the Clifford group on the left, and then on the right you have the average over the unitary group. So you have an, an, an integral now and not a sum. Um, and this is the average using the Haar measure because it's an, uh, an infinite group. So, yeah, so, so this, yes. Uh, so, so really, yeah. the average and the theorem is just the last equality that you see here. Okay, uh, so so does it work because the, this this set is uh, 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 spread out infinitely, or or uh, does it happen for, for even for a limited number of uh, qubits? Uh, it's it's an infinitely. It's it's for any number of qubits. It works. Um, yes, and okay. um, yes. Yeah, maybe it, com it was, um, yeah, maybe it confused, confused you because I wrote the notion of unitary two design. Two here is not the number of qubits. Unitary two design is something like uh, taking 
polynomials of rank two or something, but, it, but this equality works for any number of cubes. Okay, okay, and, okay. Um, and it means actually that the Clifford group is somehow spread evenly throughout the unitary group, and when you sample a Clifford element, it's like sample evenly the uh, infinite unitary group on n qubits. Understood. Uh, and uh, also, also, like relating to the to the same uh, uh, question, um, during the calculation of the of the survival probability of the success probability, um, mm -hmm. uh, there's, it's also mentioned in the textbook that the probability measurement for all the qubits and the probability measurement for only one qubit to return to the ground state uh, fit mm -hmm. the same decay parameter according to the uh, the twelve properties. So, is it is it because of the same reasoning? Um. Yeah, I think because if you have, you, you do some averaging process and then, yeah, I mean, everything is, is averaged. And also I think this is a result from the paper on simultaneous randomized benchmarking. All right, understood. I, I think here, here um, yeah, I, gave, I gave some reference here, I think. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, okay. Yeah. Um, all right, my next uh, question. Okay. Um, do uh, you have anything else to add or so? No. Okay, great. Uh, thank you. Um, thanks for that answer. Uh, and uh, the next question that I had was that you in... Right, so there are two methods of simultaneous random randomized benchmarking uh, that are mentioned, right? Mm -hmm. uh, one is uh, uh, over the full n qubits uh, space by constructing sequences from n qubit Clifford groups. And the second is to subdivide n qubit space uh, into set of qubits uh, n i and n i qubit randomized benchmarking is performed on each subset simultaneously. Uh, I, I was curious about how these two processes are different because eventually they they yield the same result. But but uh, how are these processes in, uh, fundamentally yeah. different? Yes. So basically, the output of randomized benchmarking is the so-called error per Clifford, and the question is what you want to to estimate. So if you do simultaneous randomized benchmarking on the many qubits, like maybe on the entire device, then you have like one number that tells you how much your device is good. And this is like some kind of measure, maybe like cross entropy benchmarking, like, like Google's did in their uh, quantum supremacy experiment and so on. So you have this one number and it just estimates the entire device or estimates many qubits and so on. Um, when you try to, to run simultaneous randomized benchmarking over smaller subsystems like one and two qubit uh, uh, systems, then you can actually use these uh, numbers of error per Clifford to estimate uh, the error per gates for specific gates, like like I explained before, you can estimate the error of a C0, CX gate. So this is useful because you want to calibrate this gate. And when you calibrate, it's useful to, to know its error and, and then you can calibrate it better or you publish this error so people using your device will know how much error you have on your two qubit gates. Um, yes, I mean, these errors are of course published. Uh, yeah, you, you can find them when you look at the device properties. Uh, yes, yeah, so, so, so basically it depends on what question you want to, to ask. If you want to measure your entire uh, system or you want to tune out uh, specific gates or see uh, specific subsystems, how they work. Yes. Okay, so, so uh, what, uh, it, it usually depends on the problem that we are trying to solve. Is, yes. Okay. Um, all right. Um, the next question that I had was, uh, okay, so, so in a later slide from, from now on, uh, uh, you showed the, the randomized benchmarking of uh, groups and gates, and uh, uh, I, I, was, I was curious about why the dihedral uh, structure was used in particular, yes, uh, this slide, uh, specifically this slide, and um, uh, if, if we can uh, possibly have uh, different combinations of like these geometries and of, of, of different Clifford group gates. Uh, uh, combined together. Uh, so, so yeah, my first question would be why, why dihedral? I think that, okay, so the, both Clifford groups and dihedral and synodihedral groups came from the theory of error correction codes and um, 
yeah, and and I think you need. I mean, there are some papers explaining why, in a sense, these kinds of groups are like maybe you can say like optimal in a sense, like the Clifford group. If you add one gate, which is a T gate, you already get universal. And with synodehedral, again, if you had one gate, which is just like the Hadamard gate, then again, you get a universal set of gates. So in a sense, like there are like maximal non-universal groups, and they also have applications to our corrections, as I, as I said, this is why they can. And I think the idea here was um, we want to somehow be able to benchmark um, unitaries which are non-Clifford in a way, and we cannot benchmark the entire unitary group, but what we can do, and we have a nice mathematical structure. So the hydro groups have nice mathematical structure, um, yes, and also the synodhydral group has its own structure and so on. So I think this is why, why they, came, they came to life. Um, yes, and if you can think of another interesting groups, then uh, yeah, then I, um, th then it will be interesting. For example, in the another group, as I said, it's the Pauli group. It's a subgroup of the Clifford or Synod Pauli group, or there is something called um, a real Pauli group, which contains only Paulis, Synods, and Hadamars, but without phase gates. So this is why it's called real because you don't have the i, the complex number i. Okay. Um, right. Um, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah so, so, yeah, so you can think about all sorts of groups and they should have nice mathematical structure but still be non-universal because if they're universal then uh, you have basically have everything and you cannot... Yes, yeah, so, so with the scene of the hydral group, again, we have some nice uh, compact presentation of it. So again, we can benchmark basically yeah, any... Yeah, we can simulate it uh, in a polynomial time like the Clifford group. And this is, this is a, yeah, you can look at the paper of Andrew Cross and others, um, yes, and to see how this simulation works. It's, it's more complicated than the Clifford group. Yeah, and you also have the, actually the code written in, in Ignis. It's more complicated than the Clifford group, but still you can do it in a polynomial time. Uh, all right, I, I guess uh, I do have some required reading to do. Uh... Uh, uh, and, and yeah, you do have the, uh, re um, the references mentioned below, so I will be sure to check them out. I was uh, I was mostly curious about this because uh, this looks very much like the um, uh, like the, like the structures that that groups of a uh, atoms form uh, when when uh, um, forming um, um, atomic structures uh, and and uh, forming complex geometries. And so uh, that that got me curious if uh, maybe. Uh, certain types of com if combinations of certain types of gates and uh, uh, gate, gate topologies and um, uh, these kind of geometries might uh, go hand in hand to to uh, give uh, to yield better results as compared to others. Um, so so what I, I, think what, yeah, what I mean to say is, uh, for example, like the like uh, ABB uh, ABC ABC stacking something like that, uh, as we as we see in like solid uh, solid structure solid state. Um, um, yeah. Um, yeah. I, I think one should try. I mean, try to define the gates and see, and see whether if they are universal or not universal. And if they are not universal, whether you can have like um, a nice uh, polynomial presentation of the group. In, if you can present this group in polynomial time, like the Clifford or the Synodable group. Got it. Yeah. I, I'm, yeah, I, I don't know, basically. No, no, yeah, but it's, it's, an it's an interesting research question, definitely. Thank you so much. Um, all right, our next question would be, um, so uh, in this context, uh, are we talking about um, logical qubits or physical qubits when we, when we talk about uh, benchmarking uh, uh, clipper yeah. groups over, yeah? Yeah, so um, basically um, all the circuits code in Ignis, all the circuit generators are for uh, logical qubits. I mean, we don't know how the hardware is implemented and it's the transpiler um, that, um, that does, uh, that transpiles it into the hardware. Um, when, you, uh, when you execute the circuit, or well, sorry, when you transpile the circuit, 
you can um, define the transpilation method, you can define a parameter that will, um, that will say whether uh, you would like to perform it on the logical qubits or on the um, actual qubits of the device. It depends on the transpilation, actually. But at least the algorithm itself, it's agnostic. It doesn't know uh, what is the real qubits, only logical qubits. All right, thank you. Um, uh, OK, next question would be, uh, what's the different type of noise models uh, that you uh, use, uh, tried out and tested uh, during this implementation and during your work? Uh, I, I've seen implementations of T1 and T2 uh, type errors, but, but uh, could you please elaborate on that? Yeah. OK, yes. Yeah, so, um, OK, so basically, we start with depolarized error because here you have all the theory, because here you just have the depolarized uh, channel and everything. Right. So it must work. Uh, so usually you demonstrate with depolarized. Uh, for purity, I discussed coherent noise versus non-coherent noise. So again, we did, uh, we did with coherent noise. And then um, there is also um, T1, T2 errors, um, yes, that appear in the tutorial for RB. Um, yes, and I think you can do any kind of error, like thermal relaxation error and so on. With depolarized error, it's the nicest thing, since, as I said, you should get back, basically, the depolarized parameter that you put at the beginning. So, um, yeah, you, it's worth to try. Absolutely. And I've, uh, yeah, also for, for the people watching, I have also added the... Um, the, the tutorial notebook uh, for, for people to check out and try out the code. So if, uh, if you're interested in working on this, please uh, uh, follow the link in the live chat and uh, try out the code yourself. Um, yes, sir, uh, Dr. Gary, please continue. Yes. Um, uh, is, is, that the, is that the entire answer? Or is there anything else to add? Uh, uh, what? Did you, I didn't hear your question? Um, uh, yeah, so... Yeah, I, I, I do have one more question. Um, so, did, so what are the different algorithms that you uh, uh, have tried out or maybe think are possible to generate and synthesize uh, uh, Clifford, Clifford elements? What, well, uh, since um, we saw in the slide for the Clifford groups that um, it enables us to try out efficient algorithms to uh, uh, mm. generate and synthesize uh, Different elements. Yeah. And so, uh, yeah. I, I, yeah. Yeah, so there is the algorithm of Gottesman in the original paper, I think, or in his original thesis. And then there is Aronson Gottesman. Also, he, prefer, he puts there some algorithm. And then there is some algorithm by Dmitry Maslov. And I think maybe also in the recent paper of Sergey and Dmitry Maslov, maybe there also puts there some algorithm. Yeah. Right. Um, um, Oh, oh, please go on. Sorry. Yeah, and we also have uh, yeah we, we have implemented some algorithms um, again in the in the Clifford class in Terra. Yes, I I'm not sure if it's um, the most optimal one, but there is an algorithm for synthesis. Yes. Got it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, I w I was going to ask you uh, about about more resources to 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 uh, study randomized benchmarking, but. Uh, it seems that you've already added a bunch of uh, uh, references in your in your slides, so I think that should suffice. Uh, and uh, if anyone wants to try that out, please uh, look those links up. Uh, but if if you would like to uh, recommend uh, uh, maybe a starting a good starting point for people to to try out and understand uh, randomized benchmarking, uh, would you like to suggest something, or, or does the current uh -huh. suffice? Yeah, I think there are many, many papers on randomized benchmarking with many variants and many methods. So it's really difficult sometimes to start and find your arms and legs. I think actually the Kiski textbook and the tutorials are good because then you can look only at the algorithm itself. And if you're interested in the theory, you go to start with the references and so on. Um, yeah. Uh, 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 all right. Thank you. And I, I do agree. Uh, like the the textbook and the tutorials are, are a pretty nice place for um, uh, starting out and, and experimenting with randomized benchmarking. Uh, to be honest, like this was one of the uh, 
um, uh, since we're moving into the more uh, hardware ori oriented sections, uh, this was one of uh, the more difficult transitions uh, when, when reading the textbook for me personally. Uh, but at the same time, this, this does allow me to explore like a whole uh, new domain that is currently in the works. And uh, I would definitely like to explore this more. Yes, because the theory behind it is rather complicated, both mathematical theory and physics theory. Um, yes, and this is why, why it's a bit more complicated. And also the papers, some of them are very difficult to read, but I think it's, it's worth the effort because it's a nice algorithm. And again, with the tutorials, you basically have the code, and even if you don't understand the mathematical proof and the tiny details, at least you can see that it works, and it's nice. <laughs> I agree. Uh, yeah, and you even mentioned this. Like, it's so nice that now we have like all these implementations on our on our machines ready, so we don't really need to understand all of the complicated mathematics and physics behind that, and we can just yeah. just get on with using those benchmarks to uh, to improve our own <laughs> models uh, further. So, so it, it's really nice. Yes. Yes. Indeed. I, I agree. Yes. Um, so yeah, uh, segueing from that, uh, I would like to uh, ask you if that's all right. Uh, uh, about about your work uh, uh, experience on uh, the Ignis project and subsequently uh, 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 your experience with the randomized benchmarking uh, project and and how you started off uh, uh, writing this chapter. Ah, okay. Oh, it's it's a nice story. So actually, I want to start. Maybe I'll say a few words on myself. Sure. I mean, originally, I'm a mathemat I'm a mathematician. And my uh, doctorate and postdoctorate studies were in group theory. And then somehow I found myself at IBM uh, like five, six years ago. And I started working at the cloud um, and machine learning and so on. I was like in the cloud division. Um, but then in Haifa, they started to have a small quantum team. And they heard about me and they, they said, OK, we need a mathematician. And when I came back, they said, OK, we must have a mathematician here. And I said, OK, I'm a group theorist. What do you need? And they said, exactly this is what we need. We want to work on the Clifford group. And then like my first project was they like, put these randomized benchmarking uh, papers on my desk and the papers on the Clifford group and so on. And they said, OK, we want to have an implementation. So um, actually, they had some basic implementation already of randomized benchmarking um, that many people worked internally in code, including very important people like Sergey Bravi and John Smolin and so on, and Jay Gambetta, of course. And we started transferring this into what you see now in the external repo of IGNIS. So I was in IGNIS and, and randomized benchmarking basically since IGNIS came to the, came to the world. So, um, Yes, so basically at the beginning it was like trying to find, to, to understand all the mathematics and physics, uh, complicate, complicated mathematics and physics behind randomized networking and make the code works and make it looks nice and uh, tested and tests and documentation and general enough and so on. Um, and then, um, yes, and then um, Ignis came to, to life at the first version of Ignis. We had the standard randomized benchmarking. And then we started to add more and more algorithms, usually by the request of our exper experimentalists. So it's like we added uh, interleaved randomized benchmarking and purity randomized benchmarking and synodohedral randomized benchmarking. And now we are working on implemented more and more randomized benchmarking methods, as I said, maybe um, yeah, direct randomized benchmarking, linkage randomized benchmarking, and so on. Uh, yes, and um, yes, and uh, what we have actually now in Ignis is a very basic Clifford class that deals only with one and two qubit Cliffords. But now, when we with the new release of Qiskit, we now have a real Clifford class in Terra, and we, I now have the mission of refactoring the code in Ignis to work with this uh, general Clifford class. So this is again um, a nice challenge. Um, yes, so I'm basically in Ignis and randomized benchmarking, I think, for more, more than a year now. So, yeah, so, so it's, a nice, it's a nice challenge. And personally, I like it because um, my passion is for group theory. So here I really see the groups and understand the group theory behind it. And yeah, yeah that, that, and that's it's, a nice, it's a nice project, yes. 
yeah. And that, okay. that, 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 that's a pretty cool story. Uh, that, that was really amazing. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I hope that uh, uh, that gets uh, a lot of people uh, more enthusiastic about um, uh, contributing to quantum computing uh, because uh, as, as you can also relate, it's a very interdisciplinary field and, and there's really uh, no, um, no barriers to entry uh, as long as you uh, are interested and, and can work on a specific skill set. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a really a great, great field to work in right now. Uh, yes, and it's nice that many people from various education and studies, I mean, we have physicists and mathematicians and people come from the theory of computer science and we are all joining together now to work on quantum computing and it's, it's really amazing and yeah, and it's nice we really study and learn a lot from each other. That's great. Uh, speaking of learning, like how did this chapter come to be? Uh, how how did you start? Uh, I mean, work on this chapter, and and uh, what was the the, uh, the idea or the motivation behind uh, uh, creating a, a a chapter for the textbook and uh, just to uh, help people out um, learn more about the the field and by trying out Quiskit, uh, Ignis. Uh, yeah. So I think. Um so randomized benchmarking is an important algorithm and maybe it's, I mean, it's not only in the textbook, but if you like look at, if you look Google, if you do Google and look for Kiskit and then you look at Kiskit Ignis, then the example written there and also in the first blog that Dave McKay published about Kiskit Ignis, you see the graphs of randomized benchmarking. And I think the reason is that this is like the first like, Re kind of recent algorithm to benchmark and estimate noise. I mean, I mean, at the beginning you have like a, a, a no ben, I mean, you have like ways to do T1. You have ways to calculate T1 and T2 errors and tomography. And this is like I don't know, known for decades. And randomized benchmarking, it's like I don't know, like 10 years old algorithm, around 10 years old. So it's rather recent. Um, and also um, in the algorithm itself and in its variant, variants, you have many people like Jay Gambetta and David McKay and Chris Wood and Andrew Cross, so many people working in our, uh, in IBM Yorktown involved. So, so this is why it's so important for them and also for the hardware people um, that really does benchmarks of our devices. Algorithm is important for them as well. Um, yes, so. So this is why um, we wanted this algorithm in Ignis, and we wanted it to be explained as part of the tutor, as part of the textbook and the tutorials and so on, so people can use it. Um, yeah, and um, yeah, so yeah, so I I think I wrote yeah, so I was involved in the code a lot, so also wrote the tutorial. I think um, from my experience that actually writing a tutorial is a good way to to learn. So it is for me. I'm always learning. I'm with every tutorial. I try to learn and understand it better. Basically, yeah. So this was a good way for me to learn this algorithm. Was to write the tutorial and the, the chapter in the textbook that deals with it. Right. I absolutely agree with that. And, and uh, thank you so much uh, for answering all the questions. I've got no more questions right now. Uh, we've already taken a lot of your time. We're almost about to reach the the hour and thirty minute mark. Um, but okay. yeah, but before we quickly wrap up, uh, I was, uh, if you have any questions for me or if you have any feedback, um, that, that you would like to share anything. Um, uh, thank you very much for inviting me. And I think it's a great initiative to go over the Kiski textbook and understand it better. And if you have any comments or questions and please uh, contact us in the Slack channels or in the GitHub. Uh, or ideas, I mean, someone wants to contribute or suggest more algorithms and so on, um, you're always welcome. Please. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much uh, for joining us today, Dr. Garyon. And uh, yeah, uh, thanks a lot, everyone, for, for watching and joining and asking your questions. Um, oh, again, thanks, thanks a lot, Dr. Garyon. Okay. And, thank uh, you very yeah, much. Yeah. And um, all right. Uh, we will see you in the, in the next um, discussion with a new topic and a new chapter uh, and we hope to have you join there and ask more questions as well um, all right thank you everyone take care uh